Good evening, everyone. How are you? I hope you're really ready for this energizing event. My name is Reverend Dr. Constance Simon, and I will be your moderator tonight. I'm the Assistant Pre a Professor of Christian Education and Director of the Doctorate of Ministry Program at the Ecumenical Theological Seminary. I'm also the Minister of Christian Education at Fellowship Chapel Church, United Church of Christ. And I am the Associate Conference Minister for the United Church of Christ for the Detroit Metropolitan Association. Tonight, we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to invite you to weigh in from Facebook, from all of the social media platforms with questions. But our topic is going to be a conversation about women's theology. This is a topic about women, how they manage the women in the church, and usually we're given a minor emphasis. We're not talked about much, but women are the major cont contributors in church. We're creative problem solvers in the church, and we're in many spaces where we are very much unknown and we're not given recognition for all that we do. Now, tonight's discussion is not exclusively for Black women, although women's theology is a theology of Black women. It's an open dialogue where everyone will benefit. It's not a male bashing conversation. No, we don't have the angry black woman on here. However, when you think about people being angry, I think everybody can go there, but sometimes we just get tagged with it. It's like an identity statement that really does not fit us because usually where it's happening when we're just expressing ourselves. But this is an open dialogue. Actually, it's a chance for Black men, white men, and even white women to recognize some of the biases that surround Black women and some of the things that Black women encounter. I'm engaging four Black women who hold their own in their various fields. Two are millennials and two are baby boomers. I also must add that Black women cannot be defined by the narrow lens of media that has so often misrepresented our brilliance, our beauty, and our beliefs. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And panelists, I'm going to ask you after I give a brief introduction to each one, after I introduce you, please give a little uh, information about yourself, but I really want you to speak about why this conversation is important to you. So first we'll have Reverend Kanita Harris. She's Minister of Social Engagement at Detroit Bible Tabernacle. Tell us a little more. Sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Connie, or as we so uh, affectionately call you, Mama Connie, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Vervin Kanita Harris, um, and I am a minister at uh, Detroit Bible Tabernacle, um, but my ministry expands beyond just the walls of the church. Um, I am also a practicing um, a community developer, a practitioner, if you will. Um, and I consider myself a social architect um, in that my ministry is about bridging uh, bridging groups of people together in terms of being able to impact communities, impact those um, who are in need of of impact, impacting and empowering in terms of building um, neighborhoods and, and, and all that that entails in terms of building whole healthy communities uh, in our city of Detroit. Um, and so this conversation for me um, is really important. I am an activist as well. Um, I serve as co-chair of the Interfaith Justice Committee for the People's Water Board Coalition here in the city of Detroit. Um, and as well as, as I mentioned before, being a community uh, developer practitioner, I uh, serve as the COO of Jefferson East Inc. on the east side of Detroit. Um, but this, this, in, in terms of this conversation, this conversation is really important to me uh, because of the fact that I do consider myself to be um, a womanist. Um, and and for me, the the spaces that we create for Black women of diverse experiences to be able to share um, and to reflect on our own experience um, uh, in a collective way is so important to me. Um, I believe that Black women we hold a special place in terms of the the value and contribution that we bring to the spaces that we are in 
Um, and, and I value, again, the wisdom, uh, collective wisdom of the Black woman's experience. Um, even when I think of Black women in my own family or Black women who have influenced who I am as, my, as a person and as a woman, as a theologian, um, as a human being. Um, I think it's very important for us to be able to have these spaces for dialogue in terms of understanding and reflecting on, on the experiences of Black women and, and the rich tapestry of that um, within our uh, community. So, so that's why I, I am a part of this conversation and that's why this, this excites me and why I feel that it's valuable um, to all of us, as Dr. Connie had mentioned before, that this dialogue is not just for Black women, but it is a, a space for for people of different experiences to hear um, some of the theological reflection of, of women in the ways in which we uh, embody the image of God um, in the places where we where we are. Thank you. Wow. Oh boy, you make me proud. Uh, Kanita was one of my students. <laughs> I teach womanist theology at ETS. So, oh my. Oh, what can I say? <laughs> oh, I, huh? Oh. oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were going to add something else. No. Okay. Okay. Well, our next millennial is Miss Ashley Lewis. She's a Master of Divinity student at the Ecumenical Theological Seminary. Ashley, tell us more about what you do, and then I want you to talk about the intersection. Why is this conversation important? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ashley Lewis. I am uh, a, a vice president for the UAW through the Coalition of Labor Union Women. I also work uh, for the International UAW Women's Department under the direction of Vice President Estrada. And I'm also a future leader fellow under the uh, Reverend Anthony Fellowship Program. So um, I will say what brings me here today is the intersect that has uh, really evolved through my studies at the Ecumenical Theological Seminary of understanding how faith and labor have intersected to create economic justice um, for working class people. And I don't think that people really um, understand or read Jesus in a way that really sees him as a social political figure who challenged oppression, who challenged all of, uh, all of the things that were continuously pushing people down in society. And so as a labor union activist and equally as a master of divinity student, uh, I felt like my call and what really brought me to and resonated with me with this subject was, especially as black women, to understand your oppression and to be resilient in spite of it. That's that's the story of Jesus Christ, to understand all of the things and, and all of the parables and all the teaching that he did. He took those who were the least of these. And he created and redeemed them and liberated them from the oppression that they were experiencing. And to me, the work that I do every day is to create and problem solve um, the issues that working people deal with on a regular basis, whether it be navigating child care, whether it be navigating caring for a parent while working, because many of us do so. Uh, these are the experiences specifically that Black women have endured for a long time, but understanding how to drive resolution to that, because it's not something that just affects Black women, it affects everybody. So my work from day in, day out is driving resolution for working class people, driving economic opportunity for working class people, because economic justice is the key to pushing America forward. Wow. You know, you young people should make me proud. I don't mind getting old because I think there's going to be a place for me to sit down and you all to stand up. And guess what? Not for me necessarily to sit down. We can go arm in arm. We can work this together from both ends. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Gwendolyn Norman. She's a research associate from Wayne State University. And Gwen, I'd like for you to do the same Please share in this why this conversation is important to you. But I'd like you to expound and tell a little more about um, your 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 doctorate work, your research, and what you do. Thank you, Dr. Simon. I'm very happy to do that. I wear a lot of different hats, but all my work is towards the end of improving healthcare outcomes for moms and babies. I am a research assistant. I work at Wayne State University. I also work nationally with the National Institutes of Health 
on diversity, equity, and inclusion working group. And I'm also a PI for a study that I've been doing over the last year, which is mitigating the impact of implicit bias on health outcomes, both maternal morbidity and mortality for African-American women. For over 30 years, I've done research in the area of high-risk pregnancies. And one of the things we're very aware of is that African-American women disproportionately have negative outcomes in their pregnancies. And while there is a lot that needs to be done um, in a lot of different veins for changing that, I also know that um, many of these conditions are preventable. I work um, on the for the city of Detroit with the national uh, with the maternal morbidity and mor mortality review team, and um, I'm working on a special project dealing with sepsis, which is infection in pregnancy and the disparities and outcomes there, and um, also working on a project where we're going to improve uh, decrease bias and improve respectful care. Now you asked me why I um, want to be a part of this, and it's not just my professional work, but my faith that lets me know that there are things that we can empower women to do. Knowledge is education, and we can empower women to understand why we're seeing these disparities and what they can do to advocate for themselves, for uh, respectful care, for reproductive justice, and to decrease their, their experiences with bias in the healthcare system, because we know that health-seeking behavior can be impacted by bad experiences in the healthcare system. So we want to change that, uh, because I do know that these uh, disparities that we see are preventable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one day we were on a, we were in a meeting, um, with a lot of, you know, it was a, it was a, you know, gen, multi-generational meeting. And I think one of the young people said, Dr. Norman, what is it that you do? And why is it important? And you talked about the stats behind, um, morbidity. Um, you talked about, how the the you gave data on how why um why health care is should be just a very top concern in black communities because one of the things that i know that um i think if our grocery stores weren't such food deserts and if we were able and allowed to eat better a lot of that has to do with it too because our eating patterns sometimes are not good and look don't get me wrong I'm the first one to go for chocolate when things go wrong. Things go wrong, I start eating chocolate. I'm like, ah, or something sweet. But that's not what we need to lean into when our health tells us that we have so many things that um, can impact how we live and how we will move forward. And it's historic also, Dr. Norman. I know you could talk about that too. But let's move on. We have one more panelist, someone that many of you know is reverend dr georgia hill she's the founding pastor of life church riverside and georgia will you tell us a little more about yourself and why this conversation is important to you sure um first of all uh it's important to me because um reverend dr connie is uh, a wonderful professor a great friend um, and she brought this to my attention and I just wanted to be involved. I serve as a founding pastor of Life Church Riverside. I have uh, served as an associate pastor at Plymouth United Church of Christ for uh, about 19 years. And I uh, am a an attorney. I practice law for a number of years. I taught uh, at Wayne State University in the African American Studies Department for uh, uh, just about 20 years or so. And so I am, uh, I am the absolute result of the faith of my mothers. My, my grandmother was a great woman of faith. She attended Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my mother uh, is a woman of faith, is a woman of faith, and continues to live by faith daily. And I am the direct result of the faith of my mothers. And so I'm here because it is that faith that um, makes it possible for me to be here. It is that faith that uh, makes it possible for the African-American community, and I would dare to say the country of the United States of America to really continue to thrive and flourish because in the midst of some of the most heinous treatment 
uh, that any group of people has experienced, Black women have continued to rise up, continue to stand up, and continue to speak out. And it is that public witness um, that has uh, inspired our nation, uh, kept our nation going, and and our voices really, really matter. Um, and I just love the the whole idea of of womanist theology that says that um, there are so many voices that matter, and we must go out of our way to hear those voices and to give them opportunity to. Uh, be a part of the the leadership table of life. Thank you, thank you. I think um, this is a good conversation, and I I've enjoyed what each of you have said, and I'm sure it's going to um, give everybody a lot of good ideas for questions. So please, please feel free to add into the um, chat. Now, in 2017 or 18, I went to my first women's conference. I'd taken women's theology uh, years before that. But this was a special conference because Katie Cannon was there. Matter of fact, I got a chance to hug her and talk with her. I saw um, um, so many of the theologians that were just, just at the top of their chain. And one of the things that opened up that night, that plenary, with Alice Walker. And Alice Walker gets up and she crosses her hands like over her chest. And you can show the picture of Alice Walker. And she starts to flutter her fingers. Well, this was during the time that Black Panther came out. So me and several other people were thinking, oh, you know, forever, forever. <laughs> but that's what not what she was doing. She was demonstrating in a very physically poetic way that this represented the butterflies and the butterfly's wings. And when a butterfly's wings flood, flutter, the flutter, the vibration of it goes around the world. In her own way, for me, it meant that what Black women do and how we do it affects everything and everybody. Now, we're experiencing right now the first Black woman vice president. How about that? And then we're on the verge of having the first Black female Supreme Court justice, Judge Brown Jackson. And it's so interesting because um, I was watching the media and people were saying, oh, well, maybe Joe Biden should have, President Biden should not have mentioned it. And I applaud him for having the integrity to say and speak up and let the world know that he acknowledges the fact that a black woman should be on the Supreme Court, that we have been ignored way too long in that area. So tonight, this is an important conversation that all will be enlightened by. And then for some, it's going to inform you on areas that you weren't aware of. Black women are not monolithic. We are as diverse as our ages, as our shapes, as our styles, as our thoughts, as our experiences, and as our attitudes. Our hope for our listeners will be to educate, support, for you to be able to educate, support, acknowledge, and appreciate the work of Black women. Tonight, this event was made possible through an ongoing initiative of Detroit Public Television, called The Black Church in Detroit, which airs monthly on American Black Journal. I certainly hope you'll join us and then you can go back on the web page and you can, uh, YouTube and see some of the past episodes. It's a partnership between Detroit Public Television, the Ecumenical Theological Seminary, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, and the activity is informed by a 40-member advisory committee of church and civic leaders representing the diversity of theology and thought in Detroit. The local initiative known as the Black Church in Detroit was inspired by the four-hour PBS documentary series from Henry Louis Gates called The Black Church, This Is Our Story, this is our song. This film series premiered on PBS stations nationwide in February of 2021. And it explored the 400-year-old story of the Black church in America, 
the evolution of worship spaces, and the men and women who shepherded congregations from the pulpit, the choir loft, and the church pews. Tonight, you can watch us and join the conversation live as on the American Black Journal and Detroit Public Television Facebook pages. Then you can go on the Detroit Public TV's YouTube channel and in our Facebook group, The Black Church in Detroit. We want to hear your voice tonight. Please make yourself heard and share any questions that you have for us. We'll take your questions throughout, throughout the evening, and we look forward to your, our, your input on helping to shape this important conversation. It'll also be streaming live on the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History's Facebook page. This event tonight, at, with this event tonight, we continue our commitment to cover the history and influence of the Black church in our city at a depth and with an understanding that hasn't always been afforded. And this evening, we'll focus specifically on the contributions and experiences of Black women in the church through the lens of womenist theology. We understand for many of you, this topic is new, and for others, it's familiar. So we'll start by defining what womenist theology is. And right now, I want to just add a little pin to this. This is woman, Women's Month. Women's Month. So we decided that we'd take the time and appreciate all women, but for this program tonight, it's Black women in particular, okay? We welcome your questions and comments, and we'll begin by taking a look at a highlight from one of our recent episodes on Womenist Theology as part of this discussion, and it was part of the series, and we're going to look at some key issues. So, this is a clip, and the clip is going to give you some background on, on the history and beginnings of womanist theology. All right, womanist theology is um, the biblical study, the theological precepts uh, based on really womanist theory. Womanist theory was given to us by Alice Walker, so she wasn't a theologian, she's a uh, prize award-winning author. And some theologians, uh, Dolores Williams, uh, Dr. Brown, and many others that were studying under Dr. Cone with Black liberation theology uh, carved out for them a definition of womanist theology using the tools that Alice Walker had already created just to describe what a womanist is. Right. So Alice Walker was not intentionally trying to create a theology. It's just that these women who found themselves in seminary as theologians, as biblical scholars, began to use her framework to define their own religious experiences and in academia. So uh, with Alice Walker, what she gives us is the idea that womanism is to feminism what the color purple is to lavender, right? Yes. That a womanist worldview is Black women's sense of wholeness, sense of community, sense of belonging, sense of defining ourselves against the backdrop of oppression, but not necessarily needing it or succumbing to it to define who we are. So these scholars under Dr. Cohn and others began to interpret the biblical text and the theological understandings of theology, of God, of religion, of church from the lens of the black woman. And what womanist theology does is it says that the black woman's experience is valid, it's credentialed, it's um, academic, and it's experiential. And that it is just as important as any other theologian throughout history to define our relationship and understanding of who God is. Thank you. That was the Reverend Dr. Maya Elisa Reynolds. And she was on the program earlier in the year. And if you'd like to see it, you can go back on the YouTube page and view the entire program. It was really good. And she's right. We come from so many diverse ways. And, and this history of Black women, I mean, it goes far back. There are, there's Elizabeth, a lady named Elizabeth. She was 42. And she was in, she's in Baltimore, recorded as the earliest woman preacher. 
and she preached over 50 years for the AME, for the Methodist Church. Then there was Gerona Lee, who was operating in 1783. 1783. She preached over 137 sermons. And it's interesting because back then, things were not recorded as they are now. I'm sure she has done a whole lot more. Now, when we talk about women, womanists, we get into a lot of ideas. I'm from a family of five sisters, five sisters. That's a lot of girls. And we were also trained, not trained, but my parents, my mother and my father talked about, talked to us about being authentic, about not minimizing ourselves, about being intelligent and showing up the way that we wanted to, not the way the world wanted us to. So our definition of woman is, is based on the multidimensional roles of women, black women. It's not just educated women. Because what you find is that what women do, they we all do it. It doesn't have any particular tagline or you didn't have to have any certain thing to do this. And it's not an assertion against the black men, white men or white women, but it's an acknowledgement of us, by us, for us, and unapologetically. If you know Black women, and sometimes I think we need to even stop and take the time to think about what we really do. We can think about so many warm and wonderful things. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Georgia Hill, someone shared with me a story. It was a woman whose mother had just passed. And she was so upset and she got back to town. And without your mother even talking to her, she put her arms up and held her as she cried because she just needed that. And then there's Gwen's mother. Gwen's mother is 91 years old, still driving. We had something at the church and someone said, wait a minute, I thought you said this woman was 90. And they said, she's driving. I said, yes, she's, she's able. She's able because we have elders that keep going. And the beauty of what she does is that I've watched, I've heard, let me say I've heard, I've heard that she's going to visit another elder who is very, very sick, taking food, making sure she's all right, doing things that provide comfort, because that's what Black women do. Now, I want to ask you ladies a question. You ladies represent an intersection of different careers, and you sh could you share how your mothers influenced you? My mother was very um, independent because my mother worked at a time when a lot of mothers were not working in my city. I'm from a town and um, we were proud of her. My mother was an educator. And so when when we were going to school, she was going to school. So it really seemed to kind of work. Um, she was we were very proud of her. She was very um, she she supported us. She told us that we needed to be educated and not for the sake of saying you had a degree, but because you had to be, um, you had to do something for the world. You had to serve. She and my father were very, very big on that. And as I sit back and look at my siblings, I see the fruits of their labor because none of us are just sitting on our hands. We're all doing something beyond just our homes and our little small communities. So let me ask, can you tell how your mother's influenced your work or where you are right now? I absolutely can. You just mentioned my mom, Lucille Simpson, who is watching tonight and very excited. Um, but I am a nurse because my mother is a nurse. Her mm. uh, Hearing her stories growing up of the care that she provided was um, very inspiring to me. And I remember she was the she was an LPN, but she was the first nurse chosen to open the first hemodialysis unit in the state. She was the one that doctors wanted to do this very difficult task. And uh, because she was an LPN, she had to train RNs to be her supervisors. And uh, But she was humble, but she was very confident in her skills. And um, I've watched her long after she retired. She continued to care for people. I believe she was born a nurse. She just went to school to get the training. But she's always been caring for people and a healing person. And my mother taught by example. Another thing was 
we went to church. There was never a question or discussion about whether or not you went to church. We just did it. And for me, there was really no, um, there was no problem with it. I loved going to church. I loved Sunday school where I could uh, have a chance to talk. And when, I, um, but we, we got up in the morning, we got ready. We went to church in the morning, sometimes in the evening, occasionally midweek, but going to church was a part of the fabric of our lives. So the families that uh, migrated to Detroit and were growing up, my relatives together, we all uh, went to church. And I saw my mother as someone who was very strong, very confident. My aunts were strong. They were um, empowered women who um, were living loving and principled lives. So it has impacted. I went to school to become a nurse and then ended up going into public health. And I have my doctorate in medical anthropology, but it's still along that healthcare and helping people um, to achieve and become the best they can be. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I've had the pleasure of sitting down with Mrs. Simpson and having her homemade biscuits. She still is cooking. <laughs> They're good. They're really good. Would one would would someone else like to speak up? Sure. Um, I would like to share. So this question is such an endearing question to me. Um, you know, as I had talked about uh when in opening, uh the collective wisdom of, of black women, um uh, throughout the life, I'm going to say the pearls of wisdom and sort of if you could picture in your mind, uh, you know, pearls of wisdom that each black woman in my own life um, has really been influential in shaping the type of woman um, that I have become in terms of as a as a woman of faith, as a theologian, again, as an activist um, in so many ways. Um, and, you know, my mother, God bless her um, memory, um, I lost my mother um, in 2020 um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and um, and no one could have told me that my mom would not be here today um, as so many of us have been impacted by, by the uh, pandemic. Um, but I have, uh, you know, in so many ways realized how much my mother, not in her, while she was living that I didn't, but even in her not being in this, on this side of eternity with me anymore, I, I, I find that I, that I realized how much my mother shaped me um, into the woman of integrity uh, that I am. My mother was an integral woman um, and she was a woman of faith. And she may not have, have described herself as an activist, but she was very much so involved in creating, um, you know, wholeness and well being for women. Um, mm -hmm. especially women who were victims of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, she found that to be a ministry that she was called to. Um, and, and she led that passionately advocating for women um, uh, of that experience. And she did that from um, living out the witness of her faith in that way, uh, particularly. And so that, of course, impacted me and inspired women um, within our local congregation to, to understand how one lives out the witness of one's faith in, in the form of activism. Um, and like I said, my mom would not have necessarily considered herself an activist. She just simply thought of doing the work that she was doing as being, again, a part of the witness of her faith as a child of God. And I think, again, this, this idea that I've talked about before about the Imago Dei and how important it is to understand that all are created in the image and likeness of God and that any type of violation of that um, is injustice. And so for my mother, it was so important to participate in the redemptive work of the spirit in terms of, you know, reaching out to women and, 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 and assisting them in that way. Um, my mother, she graduated from high school um, here in the city of Detroit. She grew up on the plantation in Mississippi. Mm. Um, it's still Mississippi to be exact. And, um, and her mother died when she was 12 years old. Um, but her aunt picked her up and, and brought her to the city of Detroit. And through that, my mom, she, she worked very hard. Um, and she ended up uh, convincing a, a black judge uh, to allow her to be an office manager um, at one of the earliest black law firms here in the city of Detroit. And she ran that office and, and, and eventually um, became the school administrator of one of the Christian schools, uh, only Christian school in the city of Detroit um, that we have for years, for about 15 years, Detroit Baptist Temple uh, Christian Academy. Um, and so she was a school administrator, um, but of course, uh, also uh, as a partner of ministry uh, with my father for years. Um, and she was a minister in her own right. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, 
the influence of my mother, I definitely see in, in my sense of theology around activism, around justice, um, and this idea of loving God with all your heart, soul, and might, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. But this is the call, and this is really the heartbeat of the economy of justice. Yeah. I think that that really ref that is reflective of you know my faith and my sense of of call again to participate in the redemptive work that the Spirit is doing in the world. And so you know um, my middle name is Ruth. Her name was Ruthie Harris, um, and so I'm Kanita Ruth Harris, and so I am her living legacy. And and I really make sure yeah. that I make sure that I continue that legacy of living out the witness of my faith in a way that that reflects uh, what God says in terms of from a biblical standpoint of the mm -hmm. call of the church to be missional um, and, to, and to do that in such a way that, again, we're participating in the redemptive work of the spirit in the yes. world. So, okay. yeah. Oh, good, good. Um, I um that you i did not really know your mother but i observed her and she was all that and then some but we have she to was. understand womanist theology and i think you expressed it very well where we are we are we are opposed to any type of oppression we're opposed to any type of disenfranchisement right. we try to do everything that we can to lift up not just our families but other people's families other kids um did anyone else uh, now ashley your mother and father and uh, actually everybody on this zoom had good parent teams mother and father teams mm -hmm. and your parents adopted five children that's a lot and yes. you all unconditional love i remember you all coming in as little lines like little ducks coming into sunday school <laughs> Yes. Um, and and my my thought about how my mother has affected my work is, is twofold. She actually lost her mother died giving birth to her. So I felt like that yielded an advocacy in her to care for children who weren't hers. She taught me love. She taught me empathy. Um, she taught me that black women are brilliant. She was a licensed practical nurse and then went back to school to become a social worker. She ended up getting her master's in social work while she had three kids un under under five at that time, then she would go on to adopt two. And she fostered over nine children. And wow. for me, um, she has affected my work in the sense of how do we create opportunities for women? So when they do have children, when they do open their home, they do provide love because I know that I'm the person that I am today because of the opportunities that she gave me, because of the opportunities that my father had by working for the UAW. Um, but it's those opportunities that would not have been, that, that could not occur first and foremost, had it not been for labor background, but equally thinking about how she would have been able to attain more had she mm. had the uh, structures within the society, like every other society, progressive society that we have, that has paid leave, that has um, universal pre-K, that allows women to actually show up within the workspace. And I think often about how far she could have gone because she didn't end up um, going into administration, for example, until later in her career, until we were older. And so a lot of my advocacy has to do with creating opportunities for women right in the space where they are, in spite of the child care and somebody like me who now, now my mother has dementia. And that's, that's a tough part. But mm -hmm. even in her dementia, she, yeah. uh, she teaches me patience. She teaches yeah. me how to be kind, even, even when I'm upset and going, 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 like she used to, um, <laughs> she reminds me to calm down and to give love. And so mm -hmm. she has inspired my advocacy, mm -hmm. especially yes. for working women. Thank mm -hmm. you. Amen. Amen. The, um, as we look at connecting our social experiences and with the spiritual quest for meaning, we have we can look definitely at the Bible. And one thing about the Bible is sometimes we can unpack the stories differently. We can look at the story of Naomi and Ruth, two women who leaned on each other for the good of the whole. We can look at even Esther and Mordecai, where she had to ask him and leaned in on him so she could do things. But then there were challenging stories like Rahab, who's identified as the harlot from her profession, but yet she could hear the, the, the voice of God and did what God needed. The woman at the well, identified by her behavior, but yet, what she did was she changed the trajectory of everyone that she saw when she said, 
you need to meet a man who has living water. You know, we have to look at some things differently. The Syrophoenician woman is one of the few people in the Bible that actually challenged Jesus. Challenged him. Not because she was the other, but through her story, we understood that Jesus was not trying to be yeah, my foreign no more. It showed that he was open and would, would look at things differently. And that's a lot of why um, the, the women who started um, Women's Theology, they took the time to unpack and look at things differently, differently. Now, one thing about Women's Theology is invisibility. We have a never say die attitude. We continue to go. A lot of things we do are thankless. And sometimes, unfortunately, we feel like we cannot stop. And I'm not, I don't think that's the millennials attitude now. I know the uh, baby boomers and older, we will keep going. But now I'd like to show another clip if we could. And we're going to talk about our agency, our personal agency. Theology, which if you don't know, is the study of God. And when um, Alice Walker made her description, she was talking about things that made black, gave black women agency, defined us. But when Katie Cannon, Jacqueline Grant, and Dolores Williams were in school under the um, guise of um, Reverend Dr. James Cone, who was known for liberation theology, they pointed out the fact that although we're talking about God, it was though black women were invisible, as though we were left out. We were not part of the discourse or the conversation. Yet, I've had to tell people that, you know, if black women left church, church would be closed. If black women didn't head things up, it would not happen. And one of the statements you made about people not knowing what it is, when I opened my class and I've been teaching womanist theology for the last, since 2016 at ETS, but I've, I think I've always been a womanist theologian, I have them go out and find 20 people, 20 black women. And all they have to do is, ask, have to do is them, ask, have you ever heard of womanist theology? And if you have, what is it? 99.9% um, .9 have not. Maybe one or two percent have heard the word, but they don't know the meaning. And it is the the theology, the lens of God for Black women, by Black women, about Black women. Who can better describe us than us? Now, that's a little clip that's looking at who we are and how we do what we do. I have a question, and maybe we'll start with you, um, Dr. Hill, how have you personally had to help people recognize your agency without minimizing yourself? <laughs> that is a wonderful, wonderful question. It is. Um, because it, it's a very difficult, it's a very, we walk a very fine line because I have served as a lawyer and as a minister um, not as much in academia for my personal experience, I've served with men. And uh, it's always interesting because um, you have to, um, you, you have to uh, be strong and forthright, but at the same time, you still have to work in this male dominated uh, environment, male dominated atmosphere. And so what I've endeavored to do and not always well, what I've endeavored to do is to be, uh, to be true to who I am. And I think that's one of the things that womanist theology offers us is this notion that we can be who we are right. and that our perspective matters and that it counts. And, and I just want to say this very quickly too, is that particularly in the academy, right? In the theological academy, in seminary, when you're, when you're studying all of these various theologians and, and there's this unstated belief that if you're an older white man or maybe a younger white man, that your perspective and your theology automatically counts. But that if you're Latina or if you're African-American female or if you're African woman, uh, that, that somehow that theology, that um, doesn't necessarily really count. It's like when people started talking about Katanji Brown Jackson and her qualifications to be 
uh, the Supreme Court justice, some um, conservative Republican said, well, I want to see her LSAT scores. Why mm. won't they give us her LSAT scores? Now, nobody cares about the LSAT scores. She is way, way qualified, right? She is eminently qualified. But, but, but this idea of trying to um, minimize, mm -hmm. trying to reduce, trying to limit. I mean, this is a thing that, that we deal with. Um, um, and let me just say one thing about my mother. I just want to add to that earlier conversation. It was so powerful. My mother made really sure that we all, I have two younger sisters, that we knew that black was beautiful, that black is beautiful. And she made sure of it. So we had a, we were culturally aware as kids. She made sure we were culturally aware. She she colored in every little face that came in. If it was on a drawing, on a greeting card, Christmas decoration, she colored that face in black. She had, we had black angels on our Christmas tree. We had black dolls. She had to send all the way over to Germany to get some black dolls with, with crinkly hair and brown skin. And so she made sure that we understood that black is beautiful. And so what happens when you're raised that way and then you get into this setting where you're challenged not only on your ethnicity, but on your gender, right? Yes. Um, um, it causes us to rise up and say, guess what? Our way of looking at God, right? Our theology, our way of looking at God is, is legitimate, it's valid, but more than that, it is it is precious. It, it, it is it is wonderful. It it, it, it is needed. And, and let me just bring in my biblical text, and I'm be quiet. I'm trying to be like Dr. Kenita, like I'm not gonna preach, but I'm gonna preach. So one of my favorite <laughs> women's stories is the Hebrew midwives, oh. Shem and Pua. And the reason why I like the Hebrew midwives is, is the Pharaoh told them to kill the boys. Yes. Kill the boys, right? Because he's trying to prevent Moses from doing his thing. Kill the boys. Kill all the male children. And the midwives refused. Ah. What I love about that is that they refused to kill another woman's dream. Mm. They would not kill another woman's child, another woman's future. They would not do it. And that's what womanist theology is about. It is about giving life to the next generation, giving voice to the next generation. And, and I, I'm, I'm inspired by uh, the women of the past and the women of the present because we're, we want to ensure that the table is round and that everybody has access to it. If you have to come in a wheelchair, on a walker, come on, somebody, you get to come. Yes, okay, yes, yes. Anita's thoughts, you started. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're, we're, we're moving swiftly through our time, ladies. So let's kind of be brief. But, oh, I know. Our, our, my mother's house, our door was open. People could just walk up and come in and eat. Go ahead. Was Kanita, were you getting ready to speak? No. I wasn't, but um, but I can say that I think that one of the things in terms of how we show up in terms of our agency is is I think, you know, again, going back to, you know, who has laid the foundation for us. And I think my parents laid the foundation for me, um, particularly um, in terms of the sense of identity that I had um, as as a person um, and. And I think that one of the things that my parents taught me, whether it was uh, they said it verbally, but they also demonstrated it was authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think because of that, that teaching um, and the way that they lived, um, that was something that I learned to do by looking at how they lived, but also um, and then having on my own having to figure out how do I how, how do I as a black woman sort of move through spaces. Um, and a lot of my ministry actually has not been in predominantly black context. Most of my ministry um, has been in predominantly white context or multiracial and multicultural context. And so as a black woman, I've had to actually go into 
into spaces that did that did not reflect me culturally, that did not reflect who I was. Um, and, and of course, being in those spaces was very challenging. Um, I was the second black woman to graduate from a reformed seminary, um, the reformed church in America. And then I was also the first black woman to even um, pastor uh, one of the largest congregations in the reformed church in America. Um, and so even being able to take my plus size black body voice <laughs> into a, a space, into a sanctuary and preach a sermon, but authentically show up in spaces um, in a way that reflected who I was. Um, uh, and, and doing that unapologetically uh, was, was what I was taught. And so I think the value of you know, having self-love. Um, and I think that, again, being uh, reflected back to me from my parents was so important in terms of how I showed up in places where even if I didn't see uh, myself reflected in leadership. I had grown up in spaces where I saw people who looked like me in leadership, including my father, who he was one of few ministers at the time when I was growing up in the Baptist tradition, who uh, had ordained and had a woman um, as a pastor on our uh, staff when I was growing up, um, Judy Cummings, uh, God bless her. Um, and she was the first woman really minister. And even in my own family, Bishop Corletta Vaughn, um, you know, just women that I saw in ministry and leadership and to be able to be around that to see that. Let me know that I had agency and that uh, whatever I felt God was calling me to do, that I had every right to be able to walk in that calling. Um, and so I was fortunate in that way. But I understand that's not always the experience of every woman. But that's why it's important for us to be in spaces and to be in roles so that other women can see that it's possible for us yeah. to be able to do the things that God has called us to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we're being very gentle and kind about this conversation because there are times when things happen and I, it's unconscious bias mm -hmm. or sure. the fact that some people don't want to uh, stand down from their privilege, that things happen. And I, I always ask, Lord, how do you want me to handle this? Mm -hmm. Because even if you are trying to explain your place it's like you still get that angry black woman commentary Gwen, did you want to weigh in quickly i did very quickly because um i didn't one of the things i had to do when i was doing research is go into women's rooms who were being hospitalized for high-risk pregnancies and talk to them and i didn't understand why i was seeing so many complications and when i tried to talk with physicians or other um about what it was they said well we can't do anything about these women you know we don't know why they're like this and it was um i recognized that i had to get more information i had to understand the um their lived experience what was going on i i chose anthropology because i wanted to understand the, the health and sickness and what was what they were experiencing and i found um as i started to read and understand and, and research that a lot of what we were seeing were the results of the structural racism that was going on, the care that the women were receiving, the lack of attentiveness to them. They were not being respected in the care that they were being given. And I recognized that, first of all, I had to arm myself with the knowledge and the information so that I could speak up and say, no, this is not what's going on. Um, you're, you're mischaracterizing what's happening with the women and to be able to understand all the social factors, all of the impact of structural racism all, and why women, why we see African-American women having two to three times the rate of preterm birth, why they're dying at two to, two, two to three times the rate of other women. There are a lot of things that are going on. And like I said, we know that a segment of this can be prevented. Serena Williams became very, who was already very popular, became sort of a case study for uh, when a woman said, I'm having a problem, she was not listened to. And we still yes. have a lot of women who are not listened to. And I could, yes, I could go on and talk for hours. I'm going to stop. Yes. But this is really, really important. It's my passion. Yes. It's what I'm doing research on. And we have to make a change. Right. I found a quote that I love. And it's by, mm -hmm. it's from Zora Neale Hurston. And it says, if you are silent about your pain, mm -hmm. they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. So as we move on, and I hope you have some questions. I have not seen any questions in the chat, but we know that Black women are a powerful force. It's necessary and intentional to not just be tolerated, but to be appreciated. So right. in examining the historical lens of the Black church, I want to ask, how do you use your power, your programming, and your influence to intentionally mentor, nurture, 
do whatever it is you do. And Ashley, since you did not speak on the last question, can you give us a quick answer? Yes. Uh, so I, I want to talk about ministry specifically in the form of labor. So when we're sitting across the table from, from men who are in positions of power, who can make decisions that affect your membership, it's in those times that you can't lose your agency, where you can't mm. lose, lose that voice that tells you to advocate on behalf of them. And what I've learned is, is that your agency can only be taken if you allow it. So when we show up to those spaces, I, I empower women. I encourage them. I've taught women how to get elected. I give them toolkits because the reality of it is we don't get the, get the same rule book that men get. Mm -hmm. They get groomed. Wow. They get mentored and put in oh, these positions. Yes. Yes. That's not necessarily happening when it comes to leadership, whether it be in the union, the church. Those things don't necessarily happen. So for me, it's all about I don't care what age, what you look like. It's about creating space and opportunity yes. for other women by mentoring, guiding and giving them strategy to get elected, whether it be within their local union or within their local community. Absolutely. I, I Absolutely. think listening and understanding how to listen to us is 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 major, too, on all ends. Yeah. on all ends um did anyone else want to uh, take that question or do we want to move on well we're going to move on i hope you will put in where you're come where you're living if you're on virtually um what cities you're coming from what information because before we close and i know we're getting close we got four minutes i want to thank our guests because uh, I want to say that before we end up off the air. And then I want to thank all of our viewers in cyberspace. Um, when I started this out and it became a project, I have had, which is so womanist, tons of encouragement from women all around me, all my friends out of town, in town, the churches, people just saying, come on, we're supporting. We can't wait for this conversation. Because see, this thing that you need to do, and I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to start listening to other women's stories. I want you to talk to your women's groups, your book clubs, your women's Christian fellowships, or whatever your church women's groups are. Even the women who work in the kitchen. There's a conversation. Your card clubs, your union affiliations. This discussion needs to continue to go and it needs to grow. We so often feel that this conversation is a one and done. However, it's important that we, as Black women, embrace without judgment, celebrate by recognizing, and taking the time to speak truth to power as we go forward in identifying who we are and how we are and being proud of. I know that there are a lot of young people out there. Reverend uh, Dr. Myra Reynolds did a research project by teaching some young millennials what it meant to be um, what it meant to be a womanist. All the things about it, the things to be proud of, and how you don't allow the world to look at you and identify you as a certain way, shape, or form. And what I found from the research, because it was very, it was very successful. But these young women started to look at their lives and decided that, wait a minute, I, I have something to give to the world. I have something that I want to show up. I want to do things that are going to be value added, not just to myself, but to everybody around me and do it unashamedly. But just like with everything, there's going to be some criticism. There's going to be people who look at things as though it should be just one way. And that should never happen. When I looked at um, Beyonce's last video about the nation, it was very Afrocentric. I loved it. When I see um, even Cardi B, even though some things are very interesting, it's, 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 it's really good. Because we have to understand, just like Chaka Khan says, I'm every woman. It's all in me. Amen. So in closing... I'd like you to share your parting thoughts. I'd like, uh, we have, oh, we have one minute. We might go over, but I'd like each panelist in closing to share your parting thoughts. And I want the listeners to make up your mind that this conversation should continue. Go back and share with your pastors if they weren't on this. Go talk to other women and share this video. 
So now would each person give um, a final comment? We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Hill. Well, I just want to say, um, Joyce Harris asked the question, how can we reach our younger sisters that are so entrenched in a negative and healthy and unsafe culture, unhealthy and unsafe culture? And I just want to say that, um, I'm sorry for the phone ringing back there, but I just wanted to say that part of the reason why we have people involved in unsafe and unhealthy culture is because we are involved in unsafe and unhealthy culture. And we need to, um, as women, we need to think about how we can advocate for healthy, generative, positive uh, community. And I just have to say that I've been uh, very blessed to be uh, among a number of women who are strong women of prayer, strong women of faith. And these meaningful relationships have been so wonderful for me. And so I hope that one of the things we'll take with us is just that circle of women, that circle of, of wisdom and circle of love. Uh, it's just been so wonderful in my life. And I hope that that others will have that experience and, and can share that. Mm -hmm. And I have to come in real quick because I'm going to get your other thoughts. But you all know I am not a millennial. I miss the <laughs> questions. There's some good statements in these. In this <laughs> oh my goodness. And someone wanted to know what we're going to continue this conversation. And so with that, we'll talk about that later. But um, Kanita, quickly. <laughs> sure. Um, I'll just say that um, to continue in the vein of, of, of uh, Pastor, um, but in terms of just uh, this whole thing of how do we help to support um, women who have not had the opportunity, kind of like what I was talking about in terms of my background and my upbringing, but there are some people who have not had the opportunity to have grown up um, in a home like I did or um, to have people surrounding them to help in terms of shaping and forming them in, ter in terms of their sense of call, their sense of purpose. Um, I think that if, if, if we have been blessed in that way, that one of the ways in which I try to make sure that I do that is is uh, in terms of supporting other women who may not have had the same type of opportunities as, I, as I've had is to avail myself um, in terms of time um, investing in someone else. And I think that that's important. And of course, that comes with boundaries, right? That comes with um, also making sure that we make room and space for ourselves in terms of taking care of ourselves mm -hmm. um, so that we can be life-giving to other people. We must fill our wells as well. But I think this whole thing of being able to share time and space with someone um, in terms of the way of listening, in terms of the way of just role modeling, I think is so important. And I think if you have the opportunity okay. to do that, we should do that for, for, for women. Avail ourselves of being able to share space and time with each other, share wisdom um, collectively, and in and, and that way, uh, be a blessing to one another um, so that we shape who we are. Um, and to be able to see women who, who do wonderful and amazing things is so important. Um, and then helping women along the way so that you yeah. can open up a door uh, mm -hmm. for other women to walk through um, so that they have the opportunity as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And you know what, in my experience, because I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any birth children, but I've got about a thousand. They're all over the country. They're all over the world. And I'm mothering, no, even though I'm not a biological mother. But yes, I think we do that. And I think it just comes natural. Um, um, Ashley, would you like to answer? And then we'll end with, um, with Dr. Um, Norman. Yes, um, I have a, a few thoughts. First and foremost, you can be strong and feminine. You can show up, take up space um, in the most feminine form and still be strong. And strength is also recognizing when you need to rest because even God rested, right? Yes. Um, yes. And the other thing I wanted to leave with because I'm a labor union activist, so I'm always going to leave you with a charge. Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote a book called The Outliers and he changed the view of capitalism. He said, how do we shift our society into capitalizing on their talent? And Black women, Black people, yeah. all oppressed people are a source of talent. And the only difference between them being successful and not is economics. So today, I want to challenge everybody who's listening to turn into an activist, to think about how to change our society, to shift to a society that actually works for the greater good and not for money, not for things, not yeah. for for these false gods that we have nowadays. Right. Oh, mm. thank you. Very good point. Dr. Yes. Um, I really, 
Uh, first of all, I really love what Dr. Hill said about her mother starting off and teaching them early on that they were black and beautiful. I think that for our young ladies, we really need to embrace them very early on, teaching them, um, embracing them, letting them know how important they are, how valued they are. What Ashley was saying about their talent, we all have our unique talents. We want women to learn about their bodies and to understand how they function. We want them to be able to advocate for themselves, to be able to, if you if you treasure yourself, if you look at your body as a temple and understand that it should not be abused, you should not be disrespected, that we can help to move women forward. I mean, having um, a baby is the most, the most womanly thing you can do. And we often have struggles with this. Women are taught to be ashamed. I am really advocating for doulas to be able to have women who are culturally sensitive, who can be around that woman and surprise and, and surround her and protect her when they are not others, where others are not speaking for her and, and articulating her needs when she may be in a situation where she's vulnerable and can't do that. But we have to all do that is to advocate for our young women and to, to the question that Joyce Harris had about just starting from the beginning with yeah. making them feel beautiful and loved. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, belonging is very important and belonging That's helps important. to shape our identity. And if we don't understand who we are and whose we are mm -hmm. in, a, in a very solid way, then others will come along and try to convince us that they can define who we are. That should never happen. That should mm -hmm. never happen. We need yes. to do it for ourselves. Well, we're at one oh, we're an hour and six minutes, so I'm going to close. Thank you so, so very much for joining us tonight. Thanks to all of you who are watching virtually and those who send in questions. Um, tell your friends about our Facebook group, the Black Church in Detroit. We do a ton of different themes. We've talked about incarceration. We've talked about the pandemic. But you know what's so interesting, even Black music, but what's so interesting is this womanist conversation can go in so many different ways, so many different ways. Women are doing things and we need to take the time to pay attention. Tell your friends about the Facebook group and invite them to join so we can continue the conversation there. The Black Church in Detroit Initiative is made possible by from the WETA, the Washington Educational Television Association in Washington, D.C., and AAA. We also want to thank the, all the ongoing supporters of American Black Journal. Thanks to our producers of this watch party event. Woohoo to Colleen O'Donnell and Tammy Winsell. They have been awesome to get this going. And our advisory panel with their liaison, Marty Fishoff from the Detroit Public Television. And to our esteemed panelists, I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank all the people that weigh in. Thanks to our partners, including the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History and the Ecumenical Theological Seminary for their and the advisory panel that weighs in. We have discussions. We talk about what is important. And I want you to continue to watch and weigh in because you're you you matter. We might you might have an idea that we don't have. So watch the new episodes of the Black Church in Detroit on American Black Journal. And it's always shown on the last Tuesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. And then they do an encore broadcast the following Sunday at 9.30. I'm on my way to church, but a lot of churches are still fail, uh, are not in yet. And you can get more details by going to the Black Church in Detroit initiative at One Detroit PBS dot org slash abg which is american black journal dash church i want to thank everybody and yes let's have this conversation continue um i know that it was a good night for me and what can i say let's keep it going it doesn't have to stop talk to your churches let me know i'm at the ecumenical theological seminary i'm easy to find i'm easy to find but this is a conversation. And then there's so many great, great voices, so many great voices of women who could come and share. Thank you and good night.